No one, no one knows, no one, no one knows We all woke up in an upside down Turning inside out like we've all been led astray We've been standing on the outside in Trying to find our friends like we're all just cast away Feel like we've been missing out Why else would you show up with that thing on Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Harry Potter intensive video with myself, Alexis of Ascension Diaries, with Jenny Moonstone, and with Alexia, with Ricky Leaks. We are here to review book and movie number five, but we did see your comments and your feedback on the last few videos. We want to cover a few more things that happened in the fourth book and the fourth movie before, so this video will maybe be more of a combo of four and five. We may touch on six a little bit but our intentions are more so focused and we're excited to get into this presentation. So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you guys. All righty. Um, let me present my screen. We're just going to jump on into it here. I'm tired. Okay, cool. You guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Now we can. Um, okay, cool. Um, as always, we're not endorsing you to do idol worship. I always try and say that when we're talking about things of esoteric nature, because everyone who, the people who need to hear about this the most are people who are usually scared of magic. And it's like, hey, there's nothing to be scared of if you don't idol anything. So we're not idling anything. You can do whatever we're talking about. Uh, as always, let's put on the whole armor of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, I ask for the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, shroud my feet in God's gospel, give me the sword of the spirit, and the shield of faith. Thank you so much. If you want to put on your frequencies or grab any of your protective stones, definitely do so now. This is the information that the bad people do not want you to know about, so they try and make it hard for people who do know about stuff um all right so why is so funny sorry I just <laughs> what okay just like okay and now here we go okay let's go <laughs> oh, that's funny i'm ready um okay so a really big the reason i have we are talking about harry potter with the girls and I really this conversation started with like Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table. I've been talking to, I mean, me and Jenny have already done uh, the principles of hermetics. And <clears throat> this is something that we always come back to where there are good people fighting in yes, secret societies alongside the bad people who have taken over the secret societies and everything kind of goes back to a, we need to stick together and we need to band together. And that is why Satan and all these overlords try and segregate us so much. Um, that's why there's racism at the amounts there are right now, because they simply just don't want us talking to each other and ganging. The second we all come together is a second that these dark people have like no control over us. So this is a story old as time because we're talking about fiction books. I can talk about the Bible freely. It's a fiction book, right? It was edited, right? So the Bible explains that there was an old religion with old ritualistic sacrificial um, resurrection of little G gods, basically resurrecting their souls or Osiris's souls back continually back into bodies of Pharisees back to all of these, um, again, little G gods. And this is story as old as time. And we have stories in the Bible, like Abraham, he was about to kill his son. He's like, I guess this is what I got to do. And if someone's like, no, we're not going to sacrifice that way. And then of course we do have the <laughs> savior of that little fictional book called Jesus. And he was like, okay, uh, really the story of Jesus to me is best described in Narnia and Aslan because wow. he's like, I'm going to sacrifice myself to you. I get your guys' little stupid game of sacrifice magic. I'm going to one up you and I'm going to sacrifice myself for everybody because you guys are making everybody do your nasty rituals and they're all going to have so much karma that they're not going to make it into heaven. This is also what that series, um, 
with Ted Danson and a Perfect Place, Good Place, The Good Place. Oh, have you guys seen that? Mm -hmm. The yes. Good Place is a really cute little series about um, everyone goes to heaven. All these people died. They went to heaven. It's the great place, but things aren't very heavenly in this heaven sphere and uh you realize that they're not in heaven they're actually in hell and for 500 years no one has gone to heaven because the rulers on earth are making everyone do horrible things even if you think you're vegan think you're organic think you're not doing anything the powers that be have riddled everything with so much dark magic that every single second we are sinning to where we will never be able to make it into heaven and it's not the people's fault it's like the powers that be that are doing this so this is very much indicative of these old type gods and their old type magic so in the end of the fourth book um we do talk about the triwizard tournament and this manchurian candidate character who was helping harry get to the finish line. So Harry goes to retrieve a medal and the medal trophy um, basically disallowed the people to continue staying in the race. They actually transported, teleported. It was like a Stargate into a different, into a different place where Voldemort was and Voldemort was there with Wormtail, the rat that turned into Peter Pettigrew. And they, you, first of all, they killed Cedric Diggory. So that's already a death right there. Um, a Horcrux could have been made right there because they killed a child. Um, they used blood of an unwilling host, which is Harry. They used a hand of a willing host um supporter of Voldemort which is Wormtail's arm and they do a ritual to bring Voldemort into physical form because he was like Ugh, he looked like a little parasite really and they just threw him in this big cauldron and all this like blood and ritual magic um plus a death and it was a very very hard scene but basically why this is important to understand is because um that means that Voldemort is back. He is back from the dead. And this we see this all the time in these type of ancient stories because that's what Osiris did. That's how these older religions worked. Um, and Osiris is the king of the underworld. So Ra is going to be the sun god. So in per these people, I'm not saying I believe in it. I would never say I am. R.A. because when you understand how these people worked, you understand how they used I am phrases, and we'll get into that later. But Osiris was the person of the underworld. So if you're dead, you can come back through this resurrection process. And this is what Voldemort basically did. Um, we start off the... Oh, did you want to say anything about the Osiris? I hate it so much. I just run through it. No? Okay. No, but it's very um, important and people who have no idea anything about it should certainly start researching Osiris because there is the cutesy versions that you can start with. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, so we start off, I always thought this was interesting because we visit Harry in the muggle world. It's during the spring or summer, or it's this summer right before he goes back to school and there's a drought and you do see this in the movie there's a drought happening in his little subdivision little winging whinging and um we, there's a line later on in the book where they the ministry of magic does mess with weather basically so this whole time whenever we're with the dudley the, the dursleys and Harry, they're always like, oh, I'm not a part of your world. Like, your world has no control over me. That's your stuff. And it's like, dude, my world is controlling your guys' weather. Like, mm -hmm. the people who are released from our, the bad people <laughs> in ours end up on your guys' news. Like, yes, <laughs> our worlds are very intertwined. And girls, what are we seeing unfolding right now? Ooh. <gasps> we're <laughs> we're seeing some weird headlines that we have prayed for 
about a Mr. Epstein. And <laughs> we heard Mr. Epstein. Oh my God. Uh, nowadays, we consider our alchemists to be like these Nobel Prize winning scientists. And for the past five, six years, we've been told you guys don't know shit. The only people that you can listen to are like these wizards that know science, like Stephen Hawking. <laughs> You know what else Stephen yeah. Hawking used to do? <laughs> 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 These are the people that we've been made fun of. And mm -hmm. you have to listen to the experts. And the experts are busy watching, watching midget, small, little people struggle <laughs> to solve mathematical equations on uh, chalkboards that are too tall. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not funny. <laughs> Because there's a good chance that these people were enslaved as well. Why am I laughing? I don't know. It's I'm laughing. Because really you're it's uncomfortable. Yeah. That's why I'm laughing. It's a very, it's like really like this. And this is just scratching the surface of what these people have been up to. Yes. I just want to say something because it is fake news. Um, and we talked about it last <laughs> time where, <laughs> where we hear, um, the black pillars in the movement who are like just trying to bring down anything that happens and any kind of forward movement. You have these black pill people going, nothing's going to happen. And it's so silly because they're saying nothing's going to happen to the people on that list. Bitch, half of them are already dead. They've already taken care of some of these people. Obviously, we're making fun of Stephen Hawking because he did. All the there's other names in there. Like when you go through and highlight the people who have already died or people's names who we really haven't seen. Like, for example, Tom Hanks. He his Twitter hasn't really shown anything. He hasn't done any press junkets, even though movies come out with him, he hasn't been really seen for years so don't pretend that these things are happening in real time i'm pretty sure all of this is like we're it's already been handled this has been going on since at least 2016 guantanamo bay arizona national guard went out there like in 2017 and to expand it it's already been happening for years and years the normies are finally hearing about a lot of this now so um there's going to be a lot of fake news coming out, even weather, even. Yeah, uh, there's fake weather. There's fake news about the weather. There's fake. Um, what is it called? Panic. They're just trying to make us scared. What are the aliens that they just found today or yesterday? They're tall, gray figures lurking around Bayside, which is a massive um, and somewhat historic outdoor mall, outdoor indoor mall. I used to go there all the time um, in Miami and the largest police presence in, in a hot minute. And that's saying something because there's something popping off in Miami every day, literally every day. Yeah. yeah. Um, it being the southernmost, you know, there's lots of ports and human trafficking and all that sort of thing. But they're saying that these were um, tall aliens, great aliens that weren't speaking. They were moving in complete silence and they were observing everybody. And that's just the, you know, I wasn't there. So I don't know. <laughs> we there. know these people are amongst us. We know about them. Like you said, it's there. Why are they bringing it up? Like you're, they're injecting the fear. Yeah. I mean, totally. you'd be hard pressed to find, you know, that's that's about the most terrifying thing that the Western psyche can fathom because of all of the movies and shows that we grew up with. And aliens, invasive aliens are the end all be all um, in terms of, of, you know, fear control, because uh, it's like they're here to hunt us. They're here to destroy us. And um, that's about as terrifying as it gets. Right. So anytime they want to inject that kind of fear into the collective psychology, that's where I'm like, I mean, we know that this, that, that they're real. We know that they are real negative ETs, but they are kind of the ones puppeting, you know, behind the puppeteering of the whole show. They're not, you know, just going to step out one day and be like, Oh, we're going to hunt you now. Like they've been hunting us this whole time. Yes. Um, I didn't, I will try and put it in post-production. There's an Instagram post that explains a little bit of what um, 
Stephen King explains with it how there's these like child eating extra dimensional beings that live in the mountains and they come down every 26 years. They feed on children and then they leave. There's another horror movie called Clowns. And this is another way of getting it. This is why we call the CIA clowns because they look into the missing children and CIA cases, look into see how many children CPS loses every year. So the idea is that these clowns that are under guys come and steal children for this purpose. So they've always been there, but they don't want you to realize that it's your tax dollars paying for it, (laughs) that how close they are. Um, And also with what me and Master Jeff do, he's an exorcist, like in LA. And he sees people obviously who had he deals with a lot of people who had like satanic ritual abuse done to them and horrible, horrible things because he's in the heart of the beast. Like he's with models who have to go through agencies and they've been trafficked as children. It's horrible. So the stuff he sees, like, of course we know the Kabbalah. Of course we know um, the ranks of demons and how they work, but people who only know the that part of it and don't actually work with exercising people, they always, like, unless you know the Kabbalah, which is only taught to people who look into the occult. And usually you can only get that information up till now if you were in a secret society. So when what happened basically from World War II until now, and remember, Hitler worked with Ukrainian witches, quite literally beautiful Ukrainian witches. Um, Helena Bolvinsky, some, do you guys know her name? Marie, uh, bl- Marie oh. or Squid. Wait, which one? Um, there's Marina Abramovich. She's, I don't know if she's Ukrainian or what, but she's she was part of the spirit cooking scandal. Um, are we talking about the Vril? Are we talking about it the, was the Vril? Vril? It was the Vril, <laughs> and they were beautiful blonde women. Yeah, those are the Vril. Those are the, that's the Vril Society. That's, that's the Vril Society. Yeah. So, society, not the actual Vril themselves, but right. they were a these uh, women who were into the occult, knew witchcraft, and were teaching a lot of their stuff and being conduits to these demonic forces um, for Hitler. And what was Hitler doing all throughout World War II? I'll keep reminding everyone, he was trying to get artifacts. And if you ask me, the fact we even have artifacts is proof that not only does magic is, exist, but also God is real like there's no <laughs> explanation for artifacts besides those two things because yes. artifacts are magic of some sort put into a object it can be a simple very very simple thing whatever you have around you that's something that's often asked in the bible is god will say if he's going to help you and if you ask for help he's like what do you got around you what what do you got and someone's like i have a stick he's like cool we'll make it into the staff Moses, here's a staff that will take down Egypt, and it did. So these artifacts, good and bad, are everywhere. So Hitler and Russia were rushing all over the world in places like Gobekli, like the southeastern part of Turkey and Iraq and Iran and all these places to gather artifacts. And what was he going to do with the artifacts? So we're going to see that whole story play out a lot more in the sixth and seventh book. But why it's important to understand is that you, in the 1940s is when we started hearing about aliens. And up until then, it was known that these things were demons because people knew the Kabbalah and they knew how demons hierarchy fell on these ancient texts. So they're like, they're not freaking aliens, they're demons. And we only think of aliens the way we do because of World War II. They made up this fake, oh, we're going to pretend that these demons are actually aliens. And we're going to put this fear into people because we're going to plan something to happen in 70, 80 years that it will fit into. But these things are not aliens, you guys. And the, there's a million people around that. And uh, us and Jenny were talking about this. Go check out her Patreon. She did a video and she will continue about the ice wall. 
and how we are in a society that is surrounded by this. I think it's a change in plasma and density, but it's also a consciousness bubble that we live within and almost like a cell and cells do go through mitosis. So the idea is that our bubble per se, our cell is going to cut into two pieces with two different outcomes of our future. This is why the last video we ended up with saying and explaining how important it is to keep your eye on the outcome you want. And if you're a black pillar, who's like, just thinking of all the horrible things, cool, whatever, you're going to go to the bad outcome, not my problem. But don't let their fear become your guys's fate as well. Um, so we are dealing with demons. We're not dealing with aliens. Um, they're going to push that really hard. And this is a really, really sad part of the book that I completely forgot about. Um, we, we get Harry away from the Dursleys and we go to a secret hideout. It's a townhouse that used to belong to the Black family. It still does. It's a Black family location. And because it belonged to this very old, very regal, very pure blood family. It is like a, it's a fortress. It's a great place to hide out because muggles literally can't see it. Not even wizards can see it. It's like a time and a space that has been collapsed in. So if you know the right password, you can get into the house, but otherwise the house is in invisible to everyone. So we start our journey at this house and the whole Weasley family is there. Sirius is there. Lupin is there. Certain people from the ministry we've never met until now are there. And they're telling us we there was a secret society when your parents were alive, like 15 years ago. It was called, I don't know what it was originally, but we're calling it Dumbledore's Army. And it was this whole thing of good people trying to take down this dark influence. And yes, people died. It didn't work in the 80s or in the 70s. So now it's happening for the kids now. Um, and everyone is at the house except for Percy Weasley, which is one of the Weasley's kids that graduated last year. And he actually joined like... Percy wants to be part of the ministry. Like he thinks that Dumbledore is horrible. He's believing all the fake news. He turns against his family and it tears Molly apart. So that's something that we see in. Is that him right there? Yeah. I love your little redheaded graduate with the slash. Through it. It's like, no, <laughs> he's bad because it was like bad. <laughs> He's Just trying to show off. And it's like, dude, you're not cool. Stop it. Well, how about when they were holding, there was like a, you know, the, the ministry sent their goons into Hogwarts and none other than Percy freaking Weasley had, it was like strong arm and hairy. And he's looking all proud of himself. It's like, you traitorous bastard. That's your brother's best friend. Like, it's just like super wild. He would be, he's like the equivalent of the raging like Karen leftist liberal that was like, get your vaccine, wear your mask. You know, there's gotta be one in a family, right? It was freaking Percy. Thank you. Yes. There has to be one in the family. That is what this entire, to me, video is about this entire, um, yin and True. yang. In magic, you know, of yin and yang, there is nothing that is completely good and there's nothing that is completely evil. So in a wonderful family like the Weasleys, and we'll go into their blood later, but like the Weasleys are a pure blood family. Molly's from like Merlin. Like she knows this ancient magic that other people don't even know anymore. Um, Molly Weasley's amazing. And we'll definitely cover that later. Um, it's to the point that like the Weasleys at Hogwarts should be, just as famous as like Harry Potter. Like that's how ancient yeah. their blood is. It's really yeah, they're like one of the original old blood families. And, and they're like redhead, which if you know about all this, like RH negative stuff, mm. all those people and like the original Jesus, like everyone always goes back to this weird redheaded bloodline. And the Weasleys are this Scottish redhead. It's very, very interesting. Bunch of weirdos. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they're crazy. They're absolutely insane. I love our redheads. I do too. 
age. Here. Um, <laughs> Easy people. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the good family, 1% one, 1 went bad. And then we still have to expect that bad families, like behind Alexis Rose. Alexis, can you describe what's behind you? Uh, sure. <laughs> So we have the black family tree in this scene, which was, I don't know if they described it this way in the book, but I liked the way that they did this and a household of extremist ideals about mixing with anything other than pure blood magic people and just the remnants of this household and their family line as most of them are dead or in jail and the resistance is now using their home to bring back equality to the wizarding world so it, it's a beautiful symbol and i really like that that particular symbol and it's interesting that they have remnants of even his mother and this house elf that run around that are clearly very disturbed still but they Teacher. there's they have nowhere else to be so they are the little bit of darkness that's still left in this home in a way yeah it, okay so we have the same way that Percy is an asshole in a great family. We have a asshole family that had a couple of really, really good characters. And this is the epitome of yin and yang in the darkness. Right. There'll be a little bit of light in the light. There will be a little bit of darkness. If you ask me and it was said incorrectly on star Wars, but <laughs> yes, it was. Thank you. It was said incorrectly. He should have said something <laughs> slightly different, but um, Obi Wan, what? What did he say? I haven't seen Star Wars. Obi Wan explains when Anakin starts going. Anakin was basically taught magic like five years too late. He was a little too old to learn what he was supposed to. And Yoda was like, "Yo, he has way too much fear in him." And yeah. so, and he becomes older. And the bad guys put fear into Anakin. That's all they had to do. They didn't use force. They didn't use anything. They were just like giving him bad these dream. occlumency, these bad dreams. So they were fearful bad dreams. And sure enough, this is what changes Anakin into Vader is he goes to the dark side because he's fearful. And um, he says, Obi-Wan says, only Siths deal in absolutes because Anakin's going crazy, going only this, only that. And like Obi-Wan is like, you can't be saying this because you obviously don't know true magic if you're saying that something is only bad. However, everyone laughs because saying only Siths, which are the bad guys, deal in absolutes itself is an absolute. So okay. he should have said like mostly Siths who talk like you're talking are usually end up being bad because they're not seeing both sides of the story, but he said only. So that's, it's a funny thing, but this is basically also what happens in this story. It's also very reminiscent of Hamlet, which we'll get to in a second. Um, okay. So in real life, in real life, y'all, we have a black nobility and a black family tree as well. Um, you guys, I will have links below. I have a dear friend, um, Jack Pendergrass, and he has all of this information. He has links to hours and hour long videos, but it's basically explaining this order of all the, they might've been good at the time. I'll always say that they might've been genuinely good uh secret societies that were taken over but right. the truth is that they have been taken over and like i said earlier there might be good guys that have infiltrated there are people playing the long game on both sides there's double agents there's triple agents on both sides so keep that in mind but basically there is a black nobility they are a horrible family but if anything is happening like in harry potter there's one or two good people of that family that will help the good people win because you need someone close you need someone who has their intel you need someone who has the DNA within them because DNA holds memories. So if you can unlock your DNA, you can unlock your ancestors' memories. And this is why I talk so much about 
take doing Paris lenses, but specifically using oxidizers, oxygen, because oxidizers will decalcify. This is why we always hear antiparasitics are usually arthritis medicine because they're, they're decalcifying your joints and your pineal gland and your DNA and your DNA is calcified. And that's the real reason. It's not because of telomeres. You hear all that all the time. It's because telomeres are unraveling. They're unraveling. You have to stop the telomeres. No. Go off, sis. Go off. <laughs> There's big bad people pretending they know what they, they don't know. It's actually calcified. And that's why we can't reach these 12 strands of DNA. So I'm always like, yeah, definitely take this. You'll poop out a bunch of worms. But what's really happening is you're killing your blood parasite, which is a vampire, and you're decalcifying your pineal gland, which means you'll get your gifts afterwards, and you're decalcifying your DNA, which means you will remember what your ancestors remembered, and even living people uh, that share your bloodline. Yeah, true and discernment and true memory. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, um, I want to play a recording. It's a three-minute song. It's pretty long in the book, even. And it is a very, very interesting way that we're greeted at Star, uh, Star Wars, <laughs> that we're greeted at Hogwarts. And um, the sorting hat, it's not unusual for him to sing a song, but usually it's like happy, like, hey, you guys, we're starting school. Yay! And this year, it was like dark so we know that Voldemort returned we know all this stuff but the sorting hat itself is going to say this as well so I'm going to play this let me know if you guys can hear it or not thumbs up or thumbs down okay in times of old when I was new in Hogwarts barely started the founders of our noble school thought never to be parted United by a common goal, they had the self-same yearning to make the world's best magic school and pass along their learning. Together, we will build and teach, the four friends decided, and never did they dream that someday be divided. For were there such friends anywhere as Slytherin and Gryffindor, unless it was the second pair of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw? So how could it have gone so wrong how could such friendships fail? Why, I was there so I can tell the whole sad, sorry tale. Said Slytherin, We'll teach just those whose ancestry's purest. Said Ravenclaw, We'll teach those whose intelligence is surest. Said Gryffindor, We'll teach all those with brave deeds to their name. Said Hufflepuff, I'll teach the lot and treat them just the same. These differences caused little strife when they first came to light, for each of the four founders had a house in which they might take only those they wanted, so for instance Slytherin took only pure-blood wizards of great cunning just like him, and only those of sharpest mind were taught by Ravenclaw, while the bravest and the boldest went to daring Gryffindor. Good Hufflepuff, she took the rest and taught them all she knew. And thus the houses and their founders maintained friendships firm and true. So Hogwarts worked in harmony for several happy years. But then discord crept among us, feeding on our faults and fears. The houses that, like Pillars 4, had once held up our school, now turned upon each other and divided, sought to rule. And for a while, it seemed the school must meet an early end. What with dueling and with fighting and the clash of friend on friend. And at last there came a morning when old Slytherin departed. And though the fighting then died out, he left us quite downhearted. And never since the founders four were whittled down to three have the houses been united as they once were meant to be. And now the sorting hat is here. And you all know the score. I sort you into houses, because that is what I'm for. But this year, I'll go further. Listen closely to my song. Though I commend I am to split you, I still worry that it's wrong. Though I must fulfill my duty and must quarter every year, still I wonder whether sorting 
may not bring the end I fear. Oh, know the perils, read the signs, the warning history shows, for our Hogwarts is in danger from external deadly foes. And we must unite inside her, or we'll crumble from within. I have told you, I have warned you. Let the sorting now begin. Wow. <laughs> yes. Oh, so um, we had that message from the sorting hat. Now, I want to say something because like all week leading up to this, um, I love my Patriots far and wide. And I've been in this game. It's 11-11. <laughs> I've been in this game for since 2017. Really, I saw a lot of dirty stuff happening and I saw shadows of it. I was a Democrat. I am. There's no way around it. I'm a theater student. I was a Democrat. My friends have always been part of the LGBTQ community from being a young kid. And I saw what was happening and I was able to go, oh, wait, there's something dirty happening here. And oh. I joined forces with people who were not like me. Um, they were a lot of the people that I was like, oh, you're a Tea Party person. Like, don't you know the Republican Party's lame? But like, obviously every party is lame in this country and we're finding that out now and i think in the next few days i've always said there are equal amount of republicans and democrats on the epstein flight logs yep. it's that's showing to be right and i 100 percent all week have been thinking like people come up to me and they're like let's join the republican party let's let's go out there and let's you know take this over and i'm like i totally understand why donald trump had to turn Republican in 2016 when he did, because he was Democrat. And then uh, a few years before the election, he went Republican and he ran on that ticket. And I understand why he had to do that. But at the same time, I genuinely do not understand why we have to have political parties. I do not understand why I think you should just have like 10 people on a ballot and they should say, I'm for this, I'm against this, I'm for this, I'm against this. And you should just be like, cool, I want that one. And hearing this message about the sorting hat, first of all, he's describing there were four people who wanted to teach four different groups of humans this magic. Slytherin said only pure bloods can learn magic. Gryffindor said only smart pe or only courageous people can learn magic. Uh, Ravenclaw was like only smart people can learn magic. And then Helga Hufflepuff was like everyone has to learn magic. And because be you don't want just the smart people or just the courageous or just purebloods to be teaching it because now you're leaving everyone who doesn't know the magic in a vulnerable state you're leaving them unwilling to fight back everybody needs to know magic muggles non-muggles everybody so um helga hufflepuff she is going to be known for earth the last video we covered plasma and fire which is gryffindor states of matter and elements and hufflepuff's state of matter element is earth is ground is dirt and she is the most grounded one of these um headmaster one of these founders of the school so she wanted to teach everybody she is about justice and loyalty and patience and she has a cute little badger as the um, mascot it's adorable um, and we'll go into for the next, the sixth and seventh, we'll cover air and gas. But this book really screamed Hufflepuff to me because um, we have to teach everybody. There is no prejudice. Ha everyone has to know how to defend themselves was literally what Helga Hufflepuff was all about. Um, and this is the entire basis of this um, episode five is teaching everyone because ultimately the ministry comes to school and they have a very nice when they're talking about um umbridge the book umbridge is like even way more evil than the movie umbridge they couldn't put half of the stuff she did in the movie because it would be hard to watch it was hard to listen to i had to listen to the book all week i got into a dark place 
listening to this book. It was bad. And it's so close to what Jenny said earlier, what they did to us these past four or five years. And it was triggering and your best friends turn against you and all the things. So we really do see this in this book. Um, and Umbridge comes in from the ministry and gets rid of defense against the dark arts. No one is allowed to defend themselves against this evil that has come because the ministry says that there is no evil. They said that Voldemort did not return. Um, and we also meet the lovely Luna Lovegood in this episode. I'm wearing my Luna shirt. I want to show it. Hold on. <laughs> <clears throat> You're just oh, as same as I am. I love <laughs> Luna. I love Luna Lovegood is one of the greatest characters, I think. She really is because all the other kids, I mean, J.K. Rowling did such a wonderful job at getting teenage angst, teenage brattiness. Like every character is a little asshole, which like all 15 year olds, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we all. Wasn't it? Or you know, it's a tough time. <laughs> exactly. I was an asshole at 15. So the kids <laughs> are always mean, but Luna, she sees the brightness of everything. She brings, she breaks fear. And what I was just laughing at, if you're listening to the Harry Potter books, um, any conspiracy theorist who's dealt with what we've dealt with can like totally relate to Luna because she reads these crazy magazines about conspiracies going around and the conspiracy world knows Harry Potter's telling the truth. They completely believe him. They know the dark Lord's back and Harry has a lot of conspiracy theorists, people, followers, basically. And he's like almost embarrassed about it. So he's reading Luna's crazy ass magazine. And he's like, oh, yep, that's right. Oh, yep, that's right. And then there was an article about how the minister, is it Fudge? Yeah, Fudge was actually cannibalizing and eating um, goblins. And Harry's like, oh, that's crazy. That's where I draw the line. And I just laughed my ass off because you totally, this is something that totally happens in the conspiracy realm. I have friends who, yeah, they totally know that there's a reptilian vampiric force taking over. They know that it's infiltrated the governments. There's like conspiracy theories that they're okay with they get that there's parasites in us controlling us they get it but it's when you start saying oh yeah and they're eating us and they're feeding the bodies to you and they're like no that's where i draw the line no and it's like these half woke many of our friends and it's like no like it's all true so i just thought that was so funny because like luna knows it's all true yes they are eating goblins they are eating humans yes it doesn't just stop where you are willing to accept reality. So it's so funny um, to yeah. hear Luna come into the equation. And the quibbler. Th thank you, the quibbler. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, God, Hermione is annoying in this one, like worse than ever. This is her worst book, and they don't cover it in the movie. But the whole time, Hermione is trying to free the hundreds of house elves that work at Hogwarts, like Hogwarts, the way that their food is made is house elves make it. And then they put it on the tables. They clean like Hogwarts um, housekeeping is ran by these house elves and they're treated very, very well. They're taken in and Hermione's like, Oh my God, they shouldn't be slaves. And she's trying to free the house elves the entire movie and they don't want they don't want to be freed they're like we're we have the best job in the world leave us alone little girl and like she's trying to fake them into freedom the house <laughs> elves are scared to even go out into the corridors and do their jobs because they're scared of hermione and, <laughs> and somehow she did get one of the little she gets winky and winky loses his job and winky like turns to a life of alcohol and becomes a very sad little house elf that's crying all the time and it's like yeah. they're trying to show hermione like knock it off like they don't want to be free you don't understand it's so stupid. So wow. yeah, wow. 
that's something that's happening. It's so annoying. Um, Hermione and Ron be call, become hall monitors. And apparently Brits think that's like a really cool thing. They're called prefects. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. It's so lame. Freaking, it's so <laughs> lame. I would laugh at them. <laughs> like, no. Um, but because they're made prefects, they're not allowed to hang out with Harry. And Harry does become isolated. And Harry does spend more time with Luna and Neville in this book because Hermione and Ron, Ron are kind of taken out of the equation. Um, OW owls are the standardized testing in the wizarding world. I hate standardized testing. To me, I never did as like it, it for me when I was getting near the end of high school. First of all, I graduated a year early. But everyone was like, oh, let's go take the ASVAB. Let's go take the SATs. I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. They're going to know. Like, I understood. And I've done many videos on how the um, elites try and see which kids have certain abilities. And they do it through standardized testing. So I was always the one, even at 16, 17, I was like, you guys, don't do the standardized testing. No. And everyone was like, oh, my God, my scores are so high. And they're being little idiot zombies <laughs> and i'm like you guys are so stupid but um, the last moments of joy yes mm -hmm. and then it ruins your life so um they're doing their standardized testing that year it's bullshit okay now tell me if i'm crazy which i know i am but like okay this whole book um we start off right. the book with harry seeing the trestrals which are these really cute little like bat horses that are invisible to people unless you have seen someone die and i'm sorry harry saw his mom die he saw voldemort die in when he was a baby when he was 11 i don't think professor quill quirrell lived through that did he he murdered him <laughs> he murdered professor quill when he was 11 <laughs> This guy's a killer. He's a straight up old killer. Yep. So shouldn't he have already seen death? But whatever. Cedric was his end all be all. So Cedric dies and now he can see these things. I'm pretty sure he would have seen him since he was 11. But whatever. It makes for a story. Plot um, hole. Plot hole. Okay. So yes, I really wanted to cover this because... um. I want to talk about Shakespeare in each and every one of this. We talked about how Hermione was one of Shakespeare's characters in the last book. Um, and if we also talked about the librarian series in the last book, and they go into Shakespeare, because whenever you have fictional stories that can come to life, we have to look at the fictional stories that were read the most. And Shakespeare is always going to be that. I mm -hmm. love Shakespeare because he didn't spell anything correctly. I hate when people are like, oh my God, you don't spell anything correctly. And I'm like, do you know Shakespeare? He didn't spell, literally, he made up his own language and he is awesome for it. But basically, um, this I'm actually going to read from an Indiana University um, student's, I don't even know if it was their thesis. I do know when I was in on Twitter, I do know there were like 10,000 thesis, thesis written by college students saying, okay, Harry Potter's real. And if you, wrote that you were basically inter entered into a society because you said hey i know that it's real so there's hundreds of thousands of theses of people going yeah harry potter's real so and i hate whenever i talk about harry potter they're like oh you listen to this one person who covered harry potter i'm like no i just read it and put the things together just like hundreds <laughs> of thousands of other people have done as well. So this is one of those people, Harry Potter and the legacy of the Bard, how Shakespeare influenced the world's most Zachary Williams by Zachary Williams and Hen Henninger. Okay. So down here, it's a really good article. I would definitely read all of it. Um, but basically I wanted to explain an understanding of Hamlet. We've already covered Macbeth, how it was a Scottish story. That was the first series we did. We covered a little bit of the Winter's Tale in the last video. And this one really is Hamlet. Because, let's see, the similarities between Voldemort and Richard III as villains are almost uncanny. And these similarities are a potent example of mythic criticism, drawing lines between literature written hundreds of years ago, hundred years apart, 
but having extreme similarities. While comparing Voldemort and Richard III is a great way to show Shakespeare's influence on the Potter series, there are even more connections to be seen. One is between Harry Potter and Prince Hamlet. In Hamlet, the prince of the same name is a tragic hero. He loses his father to the villain and his ultimate goal between killing the person who killed his father through the play, the death of his father and actions of the villain, his uncle Claudius have a huge impact on his mental state. The common theme of the play is madness. And though Hamlet seems to think that madness he displays is acting much of it is likely genuine. Sometimes he acted manic. Other times he was violently angry. Sometimes he was depressed. This wild mental state is seen many times. When the ghost of the king appears and Hamlet chooses to follow it, Horatio comments that Hamlet waxes desperation, desperate with imagination. This is noteworthy because Hamlet is seen this way by Horatio and Marcellus before he tells them that in the upcoming future, he will put an antic disposition on in a duel with Laertes. Hamlet speaks oddly in the third person by saying, was Hamlet wasn't, I can't talk Shakespeare, was it <laughs> Hamlet wronged Laterus? Never Hamlet. Who does it then? His madness, if it be so, Hamlet is one of the faction that was wronged. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Um, and this is exactly what we're seeing in this entire book because yes, Harry is a normal 15 year old boy. We've already covered how 15 year olds, they're going through so much hormonal changes and the testosterone peak, you are going to have, you know, fits as a normal kid, but the storyline is literally the same that's happening to Harry. And Harry, the entire time, is mad. He's mad from the get-go. And I understand that he has totally right to be. I'm not saying that's wrong, but this is really important because Voldemort can't... This whole thing is about Voldemort and Harry share a connection. And this is the first time both Harry's realizing it and Voldemort is realizing it. Yes, they share a fox feather in their wand. We'll talk about wands on the last video because that's... A whole different story um but basically there's a blood connection almost that is between harry and voldemort when voldemort dies harry will never be able to talk to snakes again because he doesn't have that voldemort trait that's how like intertwined they are basically so um voldemort harry can feel voldemort and voldemort's making harry literally in his head seem crazy he's almost doing like what palpatine uh, palpatine did to Anakin where he's making him fearful and he's putting these fearful thoughts and like hatred into Harry. So when I say Harry's being like an asshole, like he's really being manipulated by Voldemort to be in this mad state. And then of course, everything that happened in Hamlet is also happening in this book as well. Um, Harry learns that after Voldemort's attempt to kill him and the spell that used Harry's blood to revive Voldemort in the last book, a distinct connection was made between the two where they can have visions of the other person and feel the other person's emotions. So this is where we have to bring in um, Professor Snape to teach Harry how to do occlumency, which is basically covering your thoughts from the enemy to read it. And people who can read thoughts... Um, it comes to us just like you don't actually hear word for word what they're saying. You just kind of are like, oh, this is how you feel. And then you say it and the person's like, how'd you know? And it's like you don't have any protections up about your thoughts. Like you're broadcasting them. And um, people who have sight and sound and can hear and see know what I'm talking about. Um, and this is what Harry's having to deal with. So on top of all this crazy stress he's dealing with that school and the school being taken over by the ministry. Harry also has to spend his time, which he doesn't have any already. He's like not getting any sleep, uh, learning how to control and hide his thoughts from Voldemort. I will always talk about the vampiric essence of the different stuff. And the only thing I could see in this one was, this horrible treatment, which yes, they cover in the movies, but in the books, it's way worse. He, Dolores yeah. Umbridge sends Harry to detention, makes him write with a quill, I must not tell lies. And it actually 
is using his blood to permanently write in his hand, I must not tell lies. So um, that's blood magic to me. That's blood magic used specifically for traumatizing, which is what we know vampires do. They use that exact thing. So do you girls want to say anything about the last two slides? I just want to say sorry for yawning. I'm not bored. I'm, you guys know I'm super into this. You guys also know I was up like all night. So uh, that's what this <laughs> does. Oxygen in my brain. That's all. <laughs> oh, we all were. Dude, last night was crazy. Wild. Just so like no clue. Just just could not shut it off. Couldn't go to sleep. Uh, it's catching up to me though. So I know. I'm going to take a nap after this. <laughs> <sighs> okay, um, so the wizardy or the magist um the ministry sent one of their drones to the school. She's very nice, but she's evil. And she took away the teaching of how to defend yourself against dark arts. And all the kids are like, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a dark lord back. We need to know how to defend ourselves. And they're like, You don't need to know. So Harry's learning occlumency, and also in the time that he has none of. He's making a militia of children to fight against the Dark Lord, and it's called Dumbledore's Army. Um, and he's teaching all the kids basic defense against the Dark Arts that he has picked up throughout the years because he's dealt with crazy stuff the past four years. So he, he, knows, he was 11. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's already killed with his bare hands. <laughs> yeah. Bare hands. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Um, so he's like, I know a thing or two. So he teaches the kids like Expelliarmus and most importantly, the Patronus charm. Um, Jenny, me and my master Jeff Mamora did a video already called exorcism mission exorcism. And the mission exorcism is explaining how we do the exorcism process. It's mainly a parasite cleanse, but when you do a parasite cleanse, all of these emotions come up. And, um, like all of your trauma kind of comes up to the surface because parasites and trauma go hand in hand. And, um, when we just, when we just explain how to hold your light and you're going through this time and period and you're outside and you're grounding and you're pushing your big foot into the ground and you're putting the bottom of your tongue to the roof of your mouth, which makes an energetic connection, we're explaining all this, but also you have to be in a blissed out state in order to do this. You have to be the, think of the happiest time you've ever been. When was the last time you were truly happy? I don't care if you were five years old with siblings or whatever. Think of the time you were most happy, get into a blissed out state. And now we can finally start doing healing and also repel these demons inside of us to get out. And that is how you do the Patronus. That is literally how you do the Patronus. Um, you get into a state of bliss and then you blast these demons. And it's what we teach and that's what a Patronus is. So they're teaching the kids how to do that. Um, there's a lot taught we did not cover and we're not going to cover every single thing taught this year because the kids are going through a lot. But those are the two main things that I wanted to cover as far as what we're learning. Occlumency, we've been talking about it this whole time. Basically, Harry is having bad dreams of whatever Voldemort is doing. And Voldemort knows this and Voldemort is acting like Palpatine and purposefully making Harry think of really, really bad things. Um, I know a lot of people, they, I deal with people going through exorcisms a lot. I know that when you're trying to fall asleep, you'll just be thinking, okay, what do I have to do tomorrow? I have to get this and take the kids here. And you'll receive a vision of something disgusting, horrible. It could be something you did in the past that like is gut wrenching. It could be like the a picture of like dead bunnies and kitties, and it's an invasive thought. And we hear a lot about these invasive thoughts. And this is very much a real thing that humans do have to deal with. And you can learn how to um, not allow and put up a field and do exorcisms to not have this happen anymore, which is what Snape teaches Harry and what we teach on our. Um, parasite cleanse on Ricky Leaks. So this is something to just to keep in mind because it's not something we just see in Harry Potter. It is something that happens in real life and Star Wars, which my husband is going to do 
what we're doing for Harry Potter, he's going to do with Star Wars. So um, that'll be coming up this year. Yes. So if you're having a, those kind of horrible thoughts, that's actually not supposed to be your live life. And there's some people who don't go through that, but some people have it real bad. And some people are really good at hiding that little factor about their experience. So we mm -hmm. would recommend you do some oxidizers and do parasite cleanse because those voices will stop. And I've have she has <laughs> accounts of that. I have accounts of that. It helps get rid of that factor of your life. You don't have to live with that. And yeah, having the techniques to help push off and have them forget about you is one I say forget about me. It helps just kind of like alleviate, lift and move on that energy that's kind of like looming around your crown. So I don't know if there's a specific spell that Snape says. I don't remember for how to like how he was trying to like test him, but there wasn't really a spell was there like a spell that Harry was saying to like get that layer? Like, I don't remember that part. Let me see. How does Snape? And I haven't gotten to that part of the I'll book. Get... I only got to like two chapters before Snape actually teaches. So I haven't even read that recently. Right. How does Snape teach? And I loved one part about the castle. It was kind of a similar theme that showed up with the, castle that happened with the house of Sirius Black's family, where it was all of a sudden there was this required space that opened up and was available to the people who were trying to defend the innocent and do good. And so magically the Sirius Black home like showed up for everybody and was there. And then also in the castle, the castle literally created this space called the room of requirement that only if showed itself to the kids they knew were to be a part of defending the innocent and practicing defense against the dark arts, despite the total dictatorial takeover, tyrannical takeover of their education establishment, their safe place, their home, and like the loss of all the trusted teachers, like that's a lot to handle. But like, it was nice that the castle's magic gave them something good. Cause I was used to the castle showing, you know, some pipes and pits and dark places that just were there. <laughs> So it's nice to have both sides of the castle. Uh, the castle was balancing itself in this uh, movie for sure. <laughs> the castle is a living thing. Um, I mm -hmm. don't know if we really covered that. The castle, if you ask for help, the castle will provide um, for the children. The castle really is protecting the children. The cat. I mean, obviously, I I see the Sorting Hat almost as the speaking the the Good tongue point. of the castle the sorting hat knows stuff's going on it's very very interesting um, i know this is, uh i know this is sorry to interrupt i know this is book two or movie two the chamber of secrets but i was just watching it with my daughter and the staircases <laughs> the staircases move on their own and so you kind of they're like hurry up hurry up keep up keep up because the, the stairs will shift and there was a scene in the movie where the staircase shifts and brings the trio, the golden trio, immediately to Fluffy, to the door where Fluffy is guarding the sorcerer's stone. So it was like the the school wanted the golden trio to find the sorcerer's stone. And it, it really does have a consciousness and it was conspiring with, you know, the side of good to like win the day. I just, I thought that was so great. And we see that consistently throughout all the books, all the movies. That's very true. I forgot about that. This, the, yeah, they always, and they say that why is when anything bad, something bad happens, why are you guys always here? And most of the time it's because your freaking school took me here. <laughs> right. It's destiny. It's fate, you know? Yes. Oh my God. I, I don't know it, what exactly he does. I'll have to listen to that and maybe I'll put it in if I get to it. But basically okay. they explain um, that he does have three lessons and you have to be very, very well, like well rested. You have to be all these things that Harry's not because it's a very uh, busy year for the kids. So um it doesn't go too, too far. And ultimately it doesn't really work because the ending sequence um, ends up <laughs> being because, uh, because Voldemort sent Harry a vision. Uh, Voldemort sends Harry kind of two visions. One is a dream where Arthur Weasley is attacked brutally at the ministry. And he wakes up and he tells people like um, the Weasley dad is being attacked and sure enough the Weasley dad was attacked and he's not in very good 
elf for like Christmas, I think. So um, that was a true revelation that, you know, Harry did see. So they know that he uh, isn't doing a good job at blocking this influence. This entire time, I forgot to mention, Hagrid is missing. Hagrid's not in this book because he is on a secret mission for Dumbledore's army. But um, the problem is he is trying to get the giants who live in the mountains. And we talked about the giants who live in the mountains in our first episode of this and the very real life versions of those. But Hagrid is half giant, half human. I don't know how that took place, but um, he goes to the mountains where he knows the giants are and he tries to get the giants on the human, the good, not human, but the good side of the war because Voldemort is also trying to get the giants. The giants are always um, a faction that if, you know, we need them on our side. This is also shown in Tolkien and never never ending story i would even go as far as saying so um hagrid's doing that he's trying to get the giants allegiance okay so building an army <laughs> they're in britain and we explained this stuff that happens on harry potter literally just would not fly in america and this is probably the biggest thing that would not fly in America. And it's the children meeting to discuss how to fight against evil. And uh, in America, that is our Second Amendment. Everyone thinks that Second Amendment just means guns. No, it is the right to form a well-regulated militia. It is the right for everyone to come together and fight against a common enemy. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Come together, grab your arms, and we're going to fight. That is what it is ultimately about. Um, that is why Satan and Lucifer, well, Satan tries to make us separated. That is why they try so hard to push um, racism in both our real world and this Harry Potter universe. I wanted to show people really quick. Um RickyLeaks.com, all of my cure videos are there. But one of when you see my cure videos, you say you can see a video called Why Can We Legally Talk About Cures? And I did this. This is one of my favorite videos I've ever done. Um, it was on Patriot.tv's channel and it was called I Am Affirmations in the Bill of Rights. And I go into explaining how, first of all, I am affirmations are going to completely change your life. And it makes you conscious of the words you're saying and also, you know, how um, that changes what your actions are going to be. But it also covers how the Bill of Rights gave us the ability to fight back. And this is like my favorite video I've ever done. So um, check out that video. It's very similar to this and starting an army. <sighs> okay. So I always, I like having this um, Hakate crossroads in each of our videos because they do have to make serious decisions in each and every single one of these Harry Potter videos. And people don't realize you have the choice to make your own decisions. You have people making maybe a very rushed decision made out of fear. And this is just important. So in this video, we see one choice that people can do is to listen to everything the Daily Prophet says and allow the ministry to just enter the school and do what they want because you're going to pull down your pants and just listen to authority and you won't <laughs> even care if the authority has been corrupted. It's just... Get your vaccines. Oh, my God. Well, you should go to sleep. jail for not having your vaccine and be like, oh, but yeah, I don't have myocarditis or heart problems. Oh, maybe I shouldn't get my vaccine. <sighs> and then you have a choice, too, which is re realize that Harry Potter might actually be telling the truth. And maybe the Daily News is lying because Osiris or Voldemort did actually come back. You can go that route and be like, hmm, I don't know. Maybe I will keep my eye out for further instructions. And then the choice three is even more brave. And it's like, okay, go on the actual journey with Harry, Ron, and Hermione and see for yourself, which is what these 28 children did. They said, 
you know what? I don't know, but I'll be I'll be right there with you and we'll all find out together. And these are the three types of choices that people every day can make. You don't have to um make a choice that you don't have the full information for. And I always want to tell people that. What else? Oh, that's pretty much all I have for this. So then we have the final bad dream that was put into Harry's head and uh, it leads all the kids to going to the ministry. And it is the first big battle between actual death eaters versus these little groups of patriots and you have the older like it's not just the hogwarts kids it's actually grown-ups involved so they go to the ministry and um i don't even know the room they're in with all the glass balls do you notice know uh called? yes with all of the crystal balls and the prophecy that they were looking like for a prophecy room at the ministry the which ministry. is weird in itself Oh um, yeah, it was wild. It was like to like the ceiling was like freaking two hundred feet high. Yeah, that was wild. And that I mean that reminds me of the Ark of the Covenant in uh, Indiana Jones. Like, why did the U.S. military have all these artifacts? Why did the U.S. military have prophecies? You know, they have prophecies. It's just really, really, really weird. Um, so they go to this room of all these prophecies and. Bellatrix, Bellatrix Lestrange, who is technically one of um, Sirius Black's cousins, mm -hmm. and his other cousin, the Malfoys, are there, and they meet Harry and Sirius and Lupin and all the kids. There's kids with them. I think Luna is like with them, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not just the Golden Trio. It's like now oh, the kids. It's a bunch. It's Neville Longbottom's there. Luna Lovegood's there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like squad. It was the squad. They flew over is... there on the Thestrals. Right. Oh, how sweet. I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Um, So, yeah, and we see Sirius die. He goes past the curtain um, that allows him to be in this dimension or a different one. And when he goes through the curtain, that would have been a great time to have the time turner, but we don't have it. So <laughs> he's gone. He gone. Um, I do want to say the serious black in the movies and the serious black in the books are different. The serious black in the books, he's not doing well. He'll never be able to be a free man in this world. He hates being cooped up. He's kind of annoying to Harry because he wants Harry to be exactly like Harry's dad. And he's like, oh, I thought you were more like your dad. He would have loved to go for the risk. Uh, yeah, he died. So I'm learning from his mistakes. Like, mm, he's not that cool. <laughs> I was. It's kind of like a good riddance a little bit because Sirius Snape was like making the kids do stuff serious black was making the kids do stuff that like wasn't for the best or smartest moves um so yes yeah. it's, it's not that sad <laughs> but he dies which is super sad and then harry's already upset and then that happens and it happens in front of him but we get everyone out and um i don't really remember the ending that well well the final scene is where Voldemort really does show up in the ministry to meet them and try and kill them. And Dumbledore shows up last second to basically make that bat battle happen. And then the rest of the ministry shows up and sees it firsthand and believes Harry and the false fake news kind of corrupts itself in front of everybody. Because it's proof you can't lie about Voldemort not being back because everyone's seen it. Everyone mm -hmm. saw Voldemort. It's Everything Harry said up until that point, conspiracy theorists one, ministry zero, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, he's back. So, um, that you would think that would be enough in the sixth book to make everyone go, okay, sorry, Harry. And I think that's something a lot of like conspiracy theorists in our groups have to deal with. Like, you're never gonna get the people who were mean to you going, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Like, you have to just put that notion aside it's never going to happen there's still people's um righteousness 
it, it's very interesting. Um, and I'm excited to see how the next few years in real life play out. But in the sixth book, which is what we're covering next, it's somehow even darker. And um, even knowing that Voldemort is back in the public sphere, that doesn't change anything. There are people just like in World War II who were scared of the Nazis and went along with the Nazis instead of their own family and friends. So that's what we'll go on to next. A little nod to that for sure. Mm -hmm. And it was tra like, it was devastating. The fifth movie and book is like so one of my favorites for sure, because I like that finally Harry is being discussed amongst the adults as the asset he really is in the war. And he's basically demanding that sort of respect because he's put his, he's had his life like tossed around in front of him by the adults. And he had no idea as a child and he was tired of that, taking his power back and being quickly educated and equipped and then having to basically become a, mil a militia leader and educate up to like 30 kids how to without hurting each other as well like how to like secretly train to kill off adult death eaters if they try and take over just for the sake of their own like potential i don't know just to last just to live into adulthood they had to really take on these skills and a lot of us in this community have had to encourage our children as well to embrace these techniques to protect themselves from these bad dreams as well, from these intrusive thoughts and from their own establishments that they're being encouraged to engage in, like their own schools. Like we're def children are defending themselves against their own schools while at school. And a lot of these young kids in our community are aware of that duty as well, that they are supposed to be in these schools and they're supposed to kind of have a safe space for other students who maybe don't have the parents to educate them. And mm -hmm. I hear tons of stories about people in our community, their kids educating other kids and so on and passing on that knowledge, that defense against the dark arts knowledge, because it's not being taught here either. It's not being taught in the schools. It's not being taught from zero to, you know, adulthood, but there's all this discussion about trying to educate children about sexuality instead and those sorts of things in different areas of of our electromagnetic bodies and of our magic, but are not related to our defense, but more so about just accepting, I would say, I would say non-modest behavior and self-centered behavior in, in people and being less terrified by predators as they approach you and try and take advantage of you and stuff like that. So the predator level, it's interesting with Harry Potter because there isn't as much of a net gross factor, but in our society, there is like adults who go into educating children, adults who go into trying to control children, like foster care and so on. Most of them also have problems with their own relationships with children and how appropriate that is supposed to be and where where they're at, at as themselves as a mature person mm -hmm. so the in the stories they don't talk about adults preying on the children as much but it is in a way kind of it's more battling for dominance instead of more of the more i would say I would say more insidious stuff that happens in our society. So it's interesting, like Harry Potter gives you a taste, but there are still much more insidious layers that children aren't being educated about and dark arts to be defended again about and like bad thoughts and so on. So it's just a taste of it, but I'm glad that they were moving into that and then things accelerate so, f so fast into just this gang of death trying to take over the institutions that are left of the magical world but it's interesting too because they also talk about international magical world but that doesn't come in as much later on like Voldemort's taking over france and Voldemort's also taking over he's talking to the white house too there's a part where he talks i don't know if it was white house or parliament it might be parliament but he's talking to the muggles in power and yeah it's something okay. like that like he gets involved so it's very much what's happening to us and um in the books they do stop sending their kids like 
parents do stop sending the kids or rightfully so to Hogwarts. And what did we see since 2020 in the past three years for us? We have seen homeschool rates go way up. Everyone's whole homeschooling because you don't trust the schools because of what Alexis just explained. And they do. It's a very slight nod. So showing that the kids are what everyone's going after to the point that the final battle the when Voldemort whew, goes away, like the final everything lays in the Battle of Hogwarts. It is fighting at the school, the child's school. Kids die. Like it is, that's where the battle is. And that is the biggest nod to, yes, the battle is at the school. I don't care about these old men and old women who have been in the conspiracy realm. I care about the kids. The kids mm -hmm. are the only ones. I don't want the old people to know anything. You can't fill a glass that is already full. It's the children. The yeah. children. <laughs> Fuck the old people. No, no. No, no, no. No. Anyways, who cares? No, who cares? It's the kids that need this information. And it's kids that can also cast Patronus better because kids can get into that bliss, happy state more mm -hmm. than like parents can. Parents are too fearful. The whole time uh, we see Molly encounter a Bogart and she just sees her kids dead on the floor and she's trying to do ridiculous and she's crying and oh, it's Harry no. dead on the floor. It's Ron dead on the floor. That's what her Bogart turns into. And Harry <laughs> walks into this and she's just crying and it's all the kids dead. And like, he doesn't know what to do. So Lupin comes in and he says ridiculous and it goes away, but it's, that's what they're fearful of. Um, and if, parents older people have this fear you can't make a patronus you can't get into that bliss state but the kids can yeah i don't think i could get into a bliss state if that's what i saw either i'd be like fuck it i need a panic button i i want out get me out of here you know what i mean like that's totally. too challenging that's way too challenging and kids like you know it, it's just like you said you know kids animals they have their and i think you know kind of in line with what you were saying alexis like they don't really, I mean, it's very insidious in the wizarding world, but in our society, the way that the adults are predatory towards children, it's in a, they're, they're this way. They, they attack the children um, because the children are like the purest embodiment of good and of God. And to attack the light in a child is, is the, about on par with taking a, a shot at God itself, creator itself. So yeah. it's like, you know, and I think that that's why these predators are like, that's why they go after little kids because their light is so huge and they want to snuff it out. They want to, you challenge know, God. challenge God, take a shot at God because that's what the darkness wants to do. But um, I didn't know that about Molly and, and the Bogart, but I didn't, um, the Bogart, I didn't see, I didn't read the books as you guys know, but that's, uh, that's terrifying. And I think that that would be the same thing for me. Anytime things are going really like rough for me in life and, you know, say I get sick, I was just sick recently. And like my brain was going into weird spaces. It is things like that. It's about, you know, losing the most important thing to me. And it's, it feels like a personal challenge. Like, okay, you're being at, you're being shown this so that you can rise above it, like hone your inner Patronus, so to speak. But that's, as a parent, you know, that's about, that's as bad as it gets. That is the ultimate fear. Oh, so and I do notice there's a lot of people fighting who don't have kids. I I mean, yeah. there's a lot of parents, obviously, but I, I have noticed that people who don't have kids and the things that maybe they research is a little different than the people who do have kids completely understandably. Um, and I think there is something to when you have some of a, a, a baby, it's too close to home. Whereas oh when I am the aunt of babies or every single one of my friends has a 10 year old right now, and yeah. that's the age of the kids going into Hogwarts. And it's like, oh, my God, like I'm fighting for your babies. Like yeah. it's a different type of mama bear. And I think that is if you go back to the Spartans and stuff. Um, the people with kids and without kids, they did fight differently. So interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Very cool. Thank yeah. you, ladies, so, so much. Oh, this was a, oh, yeah. a hard talk. <laughs> yeah, this was. was a good one. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 
Um, and then the next one is the six. It'll be out in probably seven to 10 days. And I'm excited to covering that with you guys. Yeah. Just a final point, like people who are watching our video and are really interested in knowing the subtle differences between the books and the films, there are wonderful presentations of that already made and put on YouTube from people who aren't wanting to dig in and have some deeper discussions about these differences. But if you're looking for them, they're there. And I've been entertained by those videos. But in these videos, I'm really enjoying the commentary that we're having. And their value here is, you know, it's invaluable information. And we do, I'm just grateful. My inner child is grateful. It feels safer mm -hmm. with this information. And again, I just loved this film because it felt so great to watch the kids take their power back and be able to be fierce because I know children and they are extremely fierce. The best, I think probably the best warriors out of everybody. And you are assigned your child, like the children come and deal with all and educate their families and like keep them going. But they're that source, like the connection is source and that light and that, that motivation. And this, this book series about these children is, was a big concern. And it still is. And it's, again, it's going to be released. There's more work being done to talk about these stories and these symbols in society and keep using them. And like you said, writing the papers to show that you're a part of that class and these sort of real life issues that even discussing Harry Potter can bring us into those realms. And we do did do our armor of God and we do they don't talk about bringing in spirit or God or like the light of God to protect them or for their Patronus. But that was just one little part I would add to the book. Be like, yes, a happy thought and the faith in God that like and that sort of energy. Just tap that on top. And that would be good magic, too, you know, for protecting yourself. So out of all it's of it, that's the thing I would add. And I have noticed this kind of missing yeah. from the positive magic aspect. What you oh, yeah. just described, um, the Deathly Hollows, and it, I almost hate that. There's a lot of stuff that people are asking in the comments. I'm like, we're not talking about that now. Like, I'm right. purposely waiting till the last book um, to describe some of it. But the Deathly Hollows, I think, first of all, it is a trinity. You will not die if you possess this trinity. But it's also the invisible. It's the cloak of invisibility. That is the whole armor of God that every single person can put on. And then, of course, you have the power of the wand, which to me is the spine. And then you have a ring, which could be, I see chakras. Like, that's how I see um, auras on people. Like, I can see their chakra centers, and I can either see color and a beautiful, vibrant flow, or I can see just a dense, dark cloud around their sacral genitals area and that's like 90 percent of the people because they have an incubus so the reason why we have to deal with kids is usually they haven't had sex and if they have had sex it's like a puppy love and they're still not jaded from it so that is where your power is it has to come up your spine and the very first chakra that you can ruin that is the sexual organs so that's why kids are better at magic is literally because they don't have incubi yet wow yeah amazing <sighs> all right darlings i love you guys <laughs> i'm calling it quits right. i'm going to bed <laughs> right not time <laughs> all right i love you guys bye all right see you later